We are glad to have you back to explore with us the details of Soviet revisionism. In this episode, we will analyze critically the notion of social imperialism. Orthodox Maoists often claim that Soviet social imperialism was the result of a capitalist restoration and the consequent necessity to secure markets and resources abroad. Modern revisionist tendencies, on the other hand, often dogmatically shield the post-Stalin Soviet Union from any criticism. No matter how honest their intentions, previous works on this topic are mostly one-sided and fall short on scientific standards. In this video, we will look at economic relations only. The next video will deal with the political and military relations of the USSR with other countries. Here is what our research has revealed. 1. There was no inherent economic necessity for the USSR to exploit other countries. Unlike capitalist imperialist states, the Soviet economy was mostly self-reliant. For example, in 1984, exports and imports each accounted for only 4% of its GNP. The Soviets chose their trade partners not based on profitability, but mainly according to political criteria to foster friendly relations with neighboring countries or to support ideologically like-minded governments. And although Soviet foreign credits had an interest rate of usually 2 to 3 percent, they still were a losing game because the USSR's domestic growth was much higher, meaning that the money could have been invested at home to yield much higher profits. This highlights again that political factors were much more important in determining Soviet foreign relations. 2. Actual Soviet foreign relations were ambiguous. The way that the USSR traded with other countries was very distinct from capitalist practices. Soviet trade deals usually consisted of bilateral clearing agreements, meaning they agreed to exchange goods rather than to buy them with or to sell them for hard currency. The Soviet Union was also a market for the industrial goods of third world countries, thus giving them a reason to invest in modern factories. The USSR showed to be very flexible with payments, both for their goods and their credits. And lastly, the Soviet Union did not own transnational corporations in the Third World, except for very rare instances of joint ownership and production. Soviet trade and aid had many desirable characteristics. The Soviets took repayment for their credits in the form of locally produced goods, often from the enterprises they helped to build with their credits. This way, the Soviet Union could, among other things, ensure that their aid is used properly and beneficially. The West took repayment in the form of hard currency, and this way forced the recipients to develop their export sector. While Soviet aid almost exclusively went into the state sector and focused on industrial projects, U.S. aid almost always assisted the development of raw material production and related infrastructure. Soviet foreign investments helped its recipients to industrialize, thus hindering an international division of labor, while the West forced countries to export resources. And finally, the Soviets trained local technicians, thus reducing the dependency of their trading partner. Especially the Comic-Con and other socialist countries benefited from trading with the USSR, a fact that underscores the political dimension in Soviet trade relations. Overall, Comic-Con countries received much higher prices from the Soviet Union for their goods than what they would have gotten according to world market prices. European Comic-Con members also effectively subsidized Cuba, Mongolia, and Vietnam by providing them a market for their goods, which they bought at above market prices. Additionally, socialist third world countries received approximately 5.865 billion USD in economic aid from the Soviet Union in 1985 alone, consisting of direct cash, credit disbursements, or trade subsidies. On the other hand, Soviet foreign economic relations showed many deficits stemming from the right opportunism of the Soviet leadership. The USSR mainly exported machinery and armaments to non-socialist countries in exchange for tropical foodstuffs and raw materials. It sometimes exported weapons even to governments that used them to suppress their own people, or specifically communist movements. Until the mid-1970s, trade with third-world countries consisted primarily of bilateral clearing agreements. <laughs> 
But by the early 1980s, the Soviet Union preferred hard currency payments. In the 1970s, the import of manufactured goods from third world countries declined even further. And lastly, throughout the 1980s, the Soviet Union exported more than it imported. There are many instances in which the USSR didn't bother to help other countries industrialize the way they could have. The USSR's economic focus shifted towards accumulating hard currency and securing markets for their manufactured goods. It also sought further economic integration with the West. 3. Since the term social imperialism is rather vague, we didn't bother to include a final assessment of whether the USSR was social imperialist or not. Although Soviet trade practices were rather beneficial for their partners, there were also many right opportunist deviations reflecting nationalist interests. What makes the question even more complicated is that it's hard to find clear trends in macroeconomic data. For example, the Soviet export surplus with other socialist countries dropped significantly after Khrushchev came to power. Does that mean that Khrushchev was less of a social imperialist than Stalin? The USSR's export surplus with only Comecon countries stayed almost exactly the same between the Stalin and the Khrushchev period. Does that mean that Stalin and Khrushchev were both taking advantage of the Comecon countries? Of course, such simplistic deductions are nonsense. We have mentioned it only to highlight the ambiguity of macroeconomic data that casts doubt on any simple explanation. Only a socialist economic base that is flawed by right opportunist leadership can sufficiently explain the often contradicting aspects of Soviet foreign trade relations. Both the explanations of orthodox Maoists and orthodox Marxist-Leninists were ignoring important aspects of reality to make them fit into their respective narrative. But communists are supposed to be scientists, which means that we have to uphold revolutionary science and combine all facts according to scientific standards.